And so we begin chapter 10 in the series Jesus the God-Man, Jesus in the book of John. In our lesson today we're going to finish chapter 10, so if you have your Bibles I'll be showing the verses up on the screen, but if you'd prefer following along in your Bibles just take John and go to chapter 10, that's what we're going to, we're going to do. And John chapter 10 continues material which actually started in chapter 7. Okay. So here's a, a little review of events so far. So far, this is what's happened. A little refresher, bring everybody back uh, into the uh, flow of what we've been discussing. So first of all, uh, Jesus is challenged by His brothers to go and to promote His ministry in Jerusalem during the Feast of Booths. And uh, we see the Lord dismissing their worldly approach uh, and he does go up uh, to, the, uh, to Jerusalem, but without any fanfare, and teaches the people. And then, of course, there's great division among the people over his claims and his teachings. And we see that cycle that I talked about. You know, some people believe, some people don't believe. And then the Pharisees try to entrap him using a woman who's caught in adultery, and they do this as a ploy to try to find a charge against him. After this fails, there is again a division among his hearers with some believing and others unwilling to accept his, uh, his claims. Then we see that even the ones who say they believe in him quickly turn on him when he calls on them to obey his words uh, in order to be freed from their sins. You know, they're like insulted. Hey, we want to be your followers. And he says, OK, if you're my followers, you'll obey me and you're You'll be forgiven for your sins. You'll be free from your sins. And they're saying, what do you mean free? We're already free. So already he, he kind of prunes uh, his disciples. He then heals a man who was born blind by giving him his sight back. And this causes his main enemies, the Jewish leaders, you know, uh, the Pharisees and the priests, so on and so forth, uh, to accuse him of sinning because the miracle, they can't deny the miracle, but he did the miracle on the Lord's day. And uh, we see, we read about the, you know, the back and forth that goes on between Jesus and these uh, leaders. Um, once released from the Jews, um, we see him um, uh, revealing himself to the blind man that he uh, healed. And that blind man acknowledges his faith by worshiping the Lord. And I said the thing that was significant about that is that Jesus actually received that worship. He didn't say, oh no, don't do that. I'm just a man. I'm just a prophet. No, no. He, he worshiped Him and, and the Lord received His worship as His proper due. Then in the last scene, Jesus denounces the Jews for their spiritual blindness in not accept, uh, accepting Him. So this is going to bring us to the chapter, uh, or chapter 10 where Jesus will have one more volley of debates with the Pharisees before leaving Jerusalem and beginning a series of events that will eventually lead to His death and His burial and His resurrection. So now we're going to look at the parable of the Good Shepherd in chapter 10, one of the well-known uh, well parables. Uh, chapter 10, of course, is a continuation of chapter 9 in the original manuscripts. Uh, they didn't have verses, verse numbers, they didn't have chapters. If you actually ever saw a picture of the original script, it's just block. You know? I mean, it's the, from top to bottom, from left to right, no indentation, no commas, nothing. It's just one big block. So later on, the translators, uh, for ease of, of, of reading, began to kind of put paragraphs and chapter numbers and verse numbers to help remember uh, the material and to help find it. When they, uh, when they were studying it. So sometimes the chapter division uh, was not where it needed to be. It came in the middle of something as it is here. Chapter nine ends, chapter 10 begins, but really it's all the same thing. It's just a continuation of the same scene. So in chapter nine, Jesus you know, uh, is condemning the Jewish leaders for their spiritual blindness and their unwillingness to see or believe in Him as the divine Messiah. So what happens is that Jesus comes back to them with a parable of the Good Shepherd, um, uh, and this is what He does uh, as a response to their condemnation. Now the image of the shepherd, let me give you something like this. The image of the shepherd and his sheep is uh, most used, is the most used one to describe God and His people in the Bible. 
this imagery of, of you know, the, the shepherd and his sheep, God and his people, used over 500 times uh, in, the, uh, in the Bible. Um, and it's, it's natural that Jesus uses this imagery to describe leadership in Israel, uh, good leadership and bad leadership. Okay? Uh, the sheepfold that Jesus will talk about uh, was a common form of shelter used by shepherds for themselves and their flocks. And I, I, I want to give you kind of an idea of what they were talking about. There were two kind of sheepfolds. Uh, the first uh, was um, one that was built perhaps in an open field. Um, and uh, usually the shepherds uh, would gather stones and make a circular wall with a very small entrance, uh, maybe four feet high, uh, as thick as the so stones themselves would be, and of course as large as they would need for the, 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 uh, the, sheep that they, the number of sheep that they had. Now when possible they would put briars or thorns on the top of the walls to discourage foxes or, or other wild animals you know, from jumping on the wall and trying to get at the sheep. Now the entrance would be no wider than necessary to let one sheep at a time into or out of the sheepfold. And it was easier to count them that way. You know, if, if 10 of them go in at the same time, you, know, you're, you, know, you might lose count, but one at a time, it was easy, uh, easy to count. And once the sheep were in uh, the fold and counted for the night, then many times the shepherd would uh, you know, lay across the entranceway and would sleep in the entranceway as a way of you know, keeping them in, make sure that uh, uh, none of them would go out. And if some animal or someone would try to go in, he would be there to protect. Now another type of sheepfold was built um, where there was a cave available. Uh, the shepherd would then build a wall surrounding the cave entrance and then put that same little entryway where the sheep could come in. So you'd have the cave, the interior of the cave, and then he'd build, I don't have a picture of that, he'd build you know, this thing here with a little door uh, around the entrance of the cave. And you know, it was in one of these cave stables near Bethlehem that Jesus was born. We're always thinking of a, uh, you know, like a barn. You know, well, they didn't have barns in those days. They didn't build barns in those days. It was a, it was a kind of a cave um, stable. Uh, the manger, they say, laid him in a manger, and in the pictures we always see wood and so on and so forth. Again, this was not what they used in those days. Probably a stone, a large stone that was etched out, used as a feeding trough for, uh, for animals. So now that we have a kind of a physical description of what Jesus is talking about, so let's look at the parable itself, because now we have, you know, we've got the imagery. And let's begin reading verse one and two in chapter 10. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. So some sheep folds had a, a roughly made door used to secure the fold once the sheep were in, made of sticks and branches that are tied together. Uh, it was natural for the shepherd to use this door for his coming and going. And if one were to climb over the wall, obviously this would indicate that he was an intruder, probably with the intent to you know, steal the, the livestock. Uh, this was a familiar imagery to the people who counted many generations of shepherds. In other words, Jesus is not teaching them anything that they don't know and that they, this is their lifestyle. He didn't have to give any background information like I have to give here as we talk about shepherding. So let's look, verse three to five, he says, to him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. So Jesus now extends the imagery to include one more example of false leadership. You know, at times, several flocks of sheep um, were gathered together into a common fold and one person was left to tend the gate. Notice in the image there, I show a much larger sheep fold. Notice there's still just one gate and a couple of tents there. So sometimes the shepherd, the, the head shepherd, you know, would sleep in the tent and would leave someone else overnight to guard, to guard, the, uh, to guard the sheep. So when the shepherds arrived in the early morning to collect their sheep from among the many flocks within the encounter, they would call out to them by name. So you had two or three flocks for two or three shepherds that were all 
penned together in one, uh, in one uh, enclosure. So the sheep, recognizing their own shepherd's voice, would dutifully come out of the fold to follow him. That was a very, you had three or four uh, flocks mixed in together, but when the shepherd began calling his sheep, only his sheep would come out of the enclosure. The other sheep knew that that wasn't the voice of their uh, shepherd and they wouldn't, boo, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't move. So another thing that's unusual is that um, the Jewish shepherds of that time were different than other shepherds in other uh, countries in the fact that they, they walked ahead of their sheep. In other countries, the shepherd was in the back of the sheep, you know, moving them along and calling out to them. But Jewish shepherds actually walked at the head of their sheep. That's why uh, Jesus makes this notation, uh, interesting cultural notation here. So he, he, con he continues his parable by saying that the other sheep in the fold will not leave the fold to follow another shepherd's call or voice. The door was to keep intruders out. The sheep would not follow any voice only the voice of their shepherd. Now, you know, the sheep, they didn't know that another shepherd may be a thief or someone wanted to do them harm. All they knew was, that's not the voice of my shepherd, so I'm not going you know, to follow. So Jesus emphasizes this point that sheep will not follow just anybody, only their own shepherd. Okay, so let's keep that in mind, keep reading the parable. Um, this figure of speech Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were which he had been saying to them. So John makes another editorial comment explaining that the people did not understand the parable. They didn't get it. Of course, they understood about sheep, that they were you know, in sheepfolds. They understood that they could pick out their master's voice even when there were other voices calling at them at the same time. What they didn't understand is what all of this meant for them. So Jesus explains the parable in the next few verses. So since they can't open the meaning of the parable, Jesus clarifies what He means. So we read in verse seven and eight. So Jesus said to them again, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So Jesus is making it clear. This is another one of Jesus' I am statements where he declares his divinity in parabolic form. Okay? He's, he's, he's giving them a parable and he's telling them that he's the I am. All right? So Jesus tells them that as the door, the sheep coming through him will find food and nourishment. When they go out, they will find protection and comfort you know, through him. Just like the shepherd was a human door that kept intruders out and preserved the lives of the sheep within, Jesus protected against false teachers and leaders and provided saving grace for the sheep. Now the abundant life that he gives in context is that he is the ultimate shepherd protecting and giving eternal life to everyone. You know, the shepherd just leads the sheep to the food. Jesus is saying, you know, the, you know, he said in other places, the food I give you know, will give you eternal life. And so let's continue with what he's saying to them, verse 11 to 13, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. So here's another I am statement. This time calling himself the good shepherd. You know, in Old Testament times, the only good shepherd was God. And I'm sure this idea was not lost upon the ones who were, you know, listening to him. In essence, he says that just like a good shepherd would risk his life to save his sheep, Jesus says that he would not only risk his life, he would lay it down willingly for the flock. You see, a shepherd would risk his life for his sheep, but he wouldn't lay his life down for his sheep. I mean, after all, they're just sheep, right? Jesus says, yeah, I'm the good shepherd. I, know, not, I not only risk my life, I'm ready to lay my life down for the sheep. 
In contrast to this, he says, and now he's getting to the meat of the matter, in contrast to this good shepherd, there's the hireling. Now, the hireling is not like an assistant shepherd or a contracted worker. In this case, the hireling is someone who has gained control of the sheep in a negative way, since Jesus has you know, talked about thieves earlier. This person is only interested in personal gain from the sheep, has no love for the sheep themselves. Consequently, when danger comes, he quickly abandons the sheep and saves himself. So now Jesus is making contrasts. You know, you know, if you're talking about the good shepherd and you're contrasting that, who are you contrasting it to? Well, obviously you're contrasting it to bad shepherds. You know. And who's, who's you know, part of his audience, the ones who attacked him? Well, the leaders, the shepherds of Israel. So imagine their feeling. You know, he's talking about this is what good shepherd does, this is what the bad shepherd does, and they're shepherds. So he's getting very pointed in his comments. Let's keep reading, verse 14. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me, even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep which are not of this fold, I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. Another line. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. So again, a third I am statement, repeating the fact that He's the good shepherd. This time He speaks in the first person, and as the good shepherd He declares the following. First of all, he says, um, in the way a shepherd knows his sheep, they know him. He knows who are his true disciples and they know exactly who he is. He knows the Father and the Father knows him. Secondly, he says he will lay down his life for his followers. He has the authority to both lay it down, then pick it up again. Nobody's going to, in other words, nobody's going to take it away from me. Nobody's going to take my life, like in, in the world, you know, somebody comes up to you and you know, robs you and shoots you, they took your life away from you. But he says, nobody takes my life, I give my life. I give it and I take it back. So he has the authority to both lay it down and pick it up again. This is what the Father has told him to do. And of course, this is an allusion to the resurrection. And if they don't even get that he's talking about them, they certainly don't get the resurrection. But I want you to note something very interesting here. He goes from parabolic form to prophetic form in one breath. He's telling a parable and then within the parable he begins prophesying concerning his own death and resurrection. And then he says, he will bring together another group of disciples and make one flock of all of his followers who will follow and obey him. And this too is the will of the, uh, the Father. And this, of course, is an allusion to bringing the Gentiles. Again, another prophetic utterance within a parable. Very, very unusual. Uh, let's keep going. We've got a, the whole chapter we're going to do today. Verse 19, he says, the division occurred again among the Jews because of these words. Many of them were saying, he has a demon and is insane. Why do you listen to him? And others were saying, these are not the sayings of one demon possessed. A demon cannot open the eyes of the blind. Can he? So again, John describes the reaction of the people to the latest declaration of his divinity. Notice the cycle continuing. Some believed, this guy's nut. I, I mean, some disbelieved, you know, this guy is nuts, he's insane. And others saying, well, you know, insane people don't do these great miracles. You know, so you've got disbelief and belief after uh, what Jesus uh, says. So now Jesus begins to declare His divinity without a parable. All right? Here he was, he was saying a parable and within that he was making a declaration or a prophecy. Now he, he do, does away with the parable and he declares it openly beginning in chapter 22. Now I need to explain the Feast of Booths a little bit more. The Feast of Booths was in the fall and later in December the Jews celebrated the Feast of the Dedication. Uh, the Feast of the Dedication was a commemoration uh, of the rededication of the temple after it had been de desecrated by Antiochus Epiphanes. 
Antiochus Epiphanes was a northern king who attacked, invaded uh, Jerusalem and sacrificed a pig on the altar in the temple during his invasion. Uh, also, uh, this had taken place several hundred years back and of course by sacrificing an an a pig on the altar in the, whole, you know, in the holy place, I mean this, this, this was a sacri sacrilege and it of course, uh, the result of that, uh, it, it made everything unclean. So they had to go through the process of rededicate, you know, cleansing and rededicating the temple uh, for, from uh, worship. So when the temple was later purified, there was a dedication ceremony and the Jews continued to celebrate this history and this dedication ceremony um, uh, all into the future. As a matter of fact, they still do it to nowadays. Uh, nowadays it's called the, the, the Feast of Hanukkah the Feast of Hanukkah, and what they do is they light candles each one night, you know, every night they light, so they call it sometimes the Feast of, of Lights. So if you have that background, let's, uh, let's uh, continue with our verses here, verse 22 to 24. It says, at that time the Feast of the Dedication, that's what I've just been talking about, all right? So at that time the Feast of the Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. The Jews then gathered around him and were saying to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. So now it's been a few months since his clash with the Pharisees and Jesus finds himself once again in the temple during the, uh, another feast period. This time the Pharisees urge him to make a clear declaration about his identity. No parables. Don't, don't talk to us in parables. Come on, just you know, spit it out. Tell us, you know, are you or are you not the Messiah? Of course, their objective is to have a solid charge to make against him. They're not asking him this question because of their faith. This is just another way to try to entrap him. So Jesus responds and uh, in verse 25, he says, uh, he answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me, but you do not believe because you're not of my sheep. A couple of months have gone by, he's still referring back to what he said to them a few months ago about the sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. <laughs> That's not funny, but it's kind of funny. He said, come on, tell us, tell us. And then when he tells them, they're like, ah! You know, they, they, can't, they can't stand it. So as I say, it's been a few months since his clash with the Pharisees. Uh, they want him to speak plainly, so he responds with clarity, but a clarity that they're not ready to accept. In answer to their question, he says three things. One, he says, true believers accept the proof that He has provided in the miracles the Father has given Him to do. You know, if you believed, you would at least believe the miracles I've done, He says. They're not true believers, they're not my sheep because they rejected Him. And he, also the proof that He's offered them. You know, he knows and He is known by His true followers and they have demonstrated that they're not true by what they have done in the, in the past regardless of the fake sincerity of their question. In other words, he's saying, hey, I know who you are. I know who my people are, but I also know, you know, today we'd say, I know where you're coming from. I know what you're all about. That's, that's what he's saying to them in, in essence. So the question implies that he should do more to convince them. You know, ah, healing a blind guy, ah, whatever, you know. Raising somebody from the dead, bah, you know, we, we really want a miracle. <laughs> you know, they, and they wanted something like you know, the sun to stop, you know what I'm saying, or, or an eclipse, or uh, you know, they wanted some sort of a, a worldwide miracle. You know, healing a blind person from birth, that, that wasn't enough uh, for them. And so the question implies that he should do more to, con to convince them uh, but his answer is, look, I've done enough to convince true believers. I don't need to do any more. Second thing he says, the Father wills eternal life. 
It is His Father's will that He give eternal life to His followers. Nothing can prevent His followers from receiving this great gift. And the implication is that nothing that these Jewish leaders are trying to do will stop the Father from giving His disciples eternal life. And you know, we're, we're looking at this and we're you know, trying to exposit, we're trying to find the meaning of what's going on. You know, I'm teaching the class, I'm not preaching the class, I'm teaching the class, but right here, this will preach. I mean, this will preach. Think about it. God wants us to have eternal life. There's no trick involved, there's no bait and switch, you know, there's no, I'm hanging on by my fingernails you know, to heaven, you know, and God is going, come on. You know. If we just get in our minds that God wants us to have eternal life. He's pulled out all the stops so that we will have eternal life. You know, I would say it's ours to lose. Have you ever said that to somebody? You're so far ahead, you know, you know, you're having a, 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 a one mile race and you're already three quarters of a mile you know, ahead of the nearest guy behind you. It's, this race is yours to lose. Well, this race here, this Christianity race, it's ours to lose. The only way we lose it is if we just throw it away. Why? Because God wants us to have the eternal life. He wants that to happen. So, you know, <laughs> if it doesn't happen, it, it's not because He doesn't want it. If it doesn't happen, it's because we don't want it. So if you want it, you'll have it. How do you know? Because God wants you to have it and He'll make sure that you have it. And that's what Jesus is saying here. The Father wants, wills eternal life. And then He says, the Father and He is one. He is equal to, the same as, united to, shares the nature of God. Of course, for the Jews who don't believe this, well, this is like, this is blasphemy. So they said, tell us plainly. So He tells them plainly, the Father and I were one. I mean, you, can't, you can't make it any plainer than that. So verse 32, come on, help me. Verse 32, Jesus answers them, I showed you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? So he points out the inconsistency of their actions. They have proof of His divinity, but they're acting against it anyways. So in verse 33, he said, the Jews answer him, for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you being a man, make yourself out to be God. In effect, uh, Jesus makes them declare clearly their belief in Him. You see what's happened? He's switched it. He's forced them to say, we don't believe that you're, you know, we're, we're, we, we want to kill you because you've said that you're God and we don't believe that you're God. Ah, now the truth comes out. Now what's in your heart is pretty evident. Never mind the fake faith that you were showing uh, before. And of course, their stumbling block is that they cannot accept that God could be in the form of a man. This was just too much to even consider. 34, Jesus answered them, has it not been written in your law, I said, you are gods? If you call them gods, to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God? If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do them, though you do not believe me, believe the works, so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. So Jesus said, it's not such a stretch to assign the title of divinity to humans. Even in the Old Testament, there were such references for those who served as prophets in Psalm uh, ver chapter 8, verse 17, for example. So if those who were sent by God as prophets were called gods in the scriptures, surely one who does the miracles of God and speaks for God can also be called the Son of God. And he's giving them, believe it or not, he's giving them another way to come to faith. If you can't accept, he's saying, that, 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 that divinity dwells in me, if, if that's too much for you, well, let's take, it, let's take another route to the same end. Look at the things that I've done. Can someone who is, does not have divine power do those things? You know, take another way to, to understand. If you don't believe my teaching, at least believe what I'm doing. Believe my works. And so in verse 39, it says, therefore they were seeking again to seize him and he eluded their grasp. 
Once again, the Jews, quite unconvinced, tried to arrest him. And once again, because his time was not at hand, remember, he said, I lay down my life. Nobody takes it from me. I lay it down. And so this is proof again. They couldn't, they couldn't seize him because his time had not come. Verse 40, and he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was first baptizing. And he was saying there, many came to him, and he was staying there. Many came to him and were saying, while John performed no sign, yet everything John said about this man um, is true. Uh, many believed in him there, John chapter 10, verse 42. So John summarizes the scene and the section by closing the cycle in the same familiar way. Jesus goes out of Jerusalem to continue preaching and baptizing. The people's rationale for following him was, listen, we believe John, right? That John was from God. He didn't even do any miracles and we believed him. We believe this preaching because his preaching was powerful and his message was powerful. Well, this man here, he does miracles and he fulfills all the things that John said about the Messiah to come. So surely you know, we, can, we can believe him. So because of this, of course, some believed and despite all that he did, some disbelieved. And that continual cycle goes on. Remember, for those who are kind of new to the class, I mentioned before that the book of John is unusual because it's a series of dialogues. There's very little, he went here and he did this and then he did that and then he, you know, there's very little of that. It's just a whole series of dialogues between Jesus and His apostles and Jesus and the disciples and Jesus and the people, Jesus and the leaders, Jesus and the people who are you know, being healed and so on and so forth. And so you have these dialogues that follow each other throughout the chapters and then the result is after the dialogue is over and of course the, the actions, the miracles are over, John puts in an editorial comment um, uh, describing uh, what happened. And usually what happened is some believed and some disbelieved. And that's the end of chapter 10 and we'll stop there for this uh, lesson. I hope that you'll be back for the next time that we're together uh, and continue in chapter 11.